Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for August 28th, 2017. On today's show, we'll be talking about the news. We'll be talking about Kingsman 2 being presented in 270 degrees. Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout gets a Halloween makeover. We'll tell you what that's about. Uh, Black Mirror Season 4 trailer has been released, and our Jacob Hall has a lot to say about it. And another Jumper TV series is in the works. And in our future presentation, we will recommend... 14 actors who could play the Joker in WB's upcoming origin story. Uh, with me on today's podcast are Brad Oman. Hey, that's me. Jacob Paul. Hello, hello. And Y Tran Bowie. Hey, everyone. Okay, guys. Uh, we're, we're recording this on Friday afternoon. Jacob is in Austin, Texas, preparing for the storm. Of the century. Of the Hurricane century. Harvey. Getting ready to... Pretty much grab Texas and shake it for three days. So tell, 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 tell us, like, you just went to the store, and it was, like, barren, right? Oh, yeah. Um, if you walked in the water aisle, literally the only water left is the $3 electrolyte health water. Every other water <laughs> stripped clean. <laughs> so uh, I managed to find a few things scattered around. We had some water left over. But if you're living in Texas, you haven't bought water yet, uh, open your windows. You'll get a lot in the next day or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wish you luck. Uh, by the time this hits the site, uh, hopefully uh, you have not been hit by that big of the storm or that much of the storm. Um, let's move into the news. Kingsman, the Golden Circle, the Kingsman sequel, will be presented in 270 degrees in the Screen X format. HT, you wrote this up for the site. What do we know? So the Screen X format is a visual surround sound system that takes up 270 degrees of an auditorium. So that's three walls of an auditorium, um, which is basically VR on the next level, except probably a little bit more overwhelming in terms of just everything coming at you from all sides of the theater. Um, So Kingsman will be the first movie for 20th Century Fox that gets this treatment. They're going to get converted and then uh, projected in this uh, theater. and um, But it's not the first film. So a few Hollywood films have done it, like The Great Wall and King Arthur, um, as well as Maze Runner, I hear, but for a different um, yeah, format. company. Yes. Brad, I think you know a little bit about that. Yeah, there was a, there was a format called Barco Escape that was a thing a few years ago. That they, they did it for the first Maze Runner, and more recently they did it for Star Trek Beyond, and it was the same kind of idea where they had you have three screens, and the the second le- second and third screens are like on the left and right of the main screen in front of you, and just expand the environment around you essentially. And I don't know how or if this is different if they just gave it like a cooler name, since Barco Escape sounds like a carnival ride. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't I don't know this. Yeah, we this, we wrote an article about Barco Escape. Me and uh, Jermaine Lucier. Uh, Lucier, uh, used to uh, who used to write for the site, went and saw the Maze Runner in it, and they only had a few scenes that surrounded you. It, it was interesting. The scenes that surround you um, were kind of generated almost like a video game. Like the, it was like as if they, I don't know, it wasn't made alongside the film, so it's not like they had cameras shooting the stuff, you know, on the side angles of the shots. So mm-hmm. I, I'm wondering if this format's any different. Uh, we. When I was at CinemaCon, which is the exhibit, uh, the the convention for theater owners, Barco was showing off their Barco Escape, and they they had our like quote all over it. I don't know what our quote was, but uh, probably there are so- something. Three. Yeah, something positive. But I'm wondering what this is. I actually think we should probably seek this out and see if we can go see this somewhere, uh, because like, what is on those side? screens i can't imagine what you'd be looking at for a whole movie especially if it's not something they filmed during production yeah um it seems like they're just converting films into this format and not actually shooting for this format so it sounds like it won't be able to actually give you an immersive experience like they promise uh which will probably be less uh not worth the money i don't know there are only i think three theaters who show it in the u.s So it'll be hard to get this kind of screening in the first place, I think. And it looks like it's Las Vegas and Los Angeles, which means that uh, me and Ben are going to have to take a trip. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So moving on, also in the news, uh, Disney's California Adventure theme park for the first time ever is going to join 
uh, Disney's annual Halloween time makeover. And part of that makeover they just announced is they are turning the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout attraction into a special Guardians of the Galaxy Monsters After Dark attraction. And interestingly, that they're not converting it for the entire entire Halloween time uh, season. It's only going to happen at nighttime during that season. And basically, um, if you don't know anything about the ride, uh, you should read our articles on SlashFilm.com. But basically, it is the Guardians of the Galaxy have been captured by the collector or being shown off at his museum. And normally on the ride, you go you go in and help the Guardians of the Galaxy escape. Uh, hence the name Mission Breakout. And when... The Guardians escape. It's not just the Guardians escape. All the monsters and stuff that are in the collector's collection also escape. So now this Monsters After Dark makeover of the attraction is actually kind of a sequel to the ride because it's interesting that basically if you go back to the attraction After Dark, the Guardians have realized that their pal Groot has been left behind and they have to go back into uh, the collector's museum and break him out. But the monsters have taken over the museum, so it's um I guess they're gonna have um you know uh, uh, it's gonna be darker. There's gonna be alarm sign uh, so- sounds going off and lighting all around the, the fortress, and uh, you're, there's gonna be a new uh, ride experience with the new song uh, "Monsters After Dark," uh, uh, but uh, the 1970s punk rock song. Uh, created by Tyler Bates, the composer of Guardians of the Galaxy. And uh, it's going to be a whole new experience. I'm going to definitely go there and check this out, and I'll probably have a report on uh, SlashFilm.com. I think it's cool that Disney... I mean, they just launched this ride like a couple months ago, and it's cool that they are already updating it with new content. And I think uh, that was the promise of Star Tours uh, when when that launched. And it's exciting to see Disney doing more of that, and especially with rides with screens. That's always a possibility. Can I ask you a question, Peter? Sure. Um, I know that Disney's always had a special Halloween event and Halloween makeovers, but this, where it's a ride transformed into a new experience after dark, sounds like a universal move, a universal Halloween Horror Nights move, where instead of just having a gentle re-theme like Disney's had in the past, maybe special parties, it's a whole, it's almost like a haunted house experience being implanted on top of a previous ride. Am, am I reading too much into this, or is this Disney chasing Universal again? Huh. Um, well, D- Disneyland, I know you're more of a Disney World guy, and Disneyland Haunt- Haunted Mansion gets transformed into uh, a Nightmare Before Christmas uh, ride during Halloween time. And also uh, Jungle Cruise gets transformed into Jingle Cruise during Christmas time. But that's more of a – yeah, you're right. That's more of a gentle retheming. Uh, I think this is the first time that they're doing something that – you know what? I'm wrong. Uh, Mission uh, Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, the ride that this was based on, before it was gonna uh, go away from Disney's Holy uh, Disney, ah, Disney's California Adventure, they did a thing after dark that basically you could ride uh, Tower of Terror in the dark, and it was basically Tower of Terror without the lights on. And uh, I think that's the first time they've done it. But this, yeah, this is definitely the second time they've done a kind of timed thing like that. Um, they're not doing a sec- separate ticket price, so I don't think it's like Halloween Horror Nights. Although Disney does do their Mickey's Halloween Party, which you pay a lot of money to get some candy and see some costume characters that you n- normally wouldn't see, like uh, villains and stuff wandering around, uh, and some photo ops. It's not as exciting as Halloween Horror Nights, but uh, you might be right. They might be trying to compete against that uh, whole seasonal thing that Universal has uh, made a lot of money off of. Um also in the news, uh, another Jumper TV show is in the works and might bring back Jamie Bell. Brad, do we need two Jumper TV shows? What do we know? I think we need three Jumper TV shows. <laughs> also, we should explain what Jumper is because maybe maybe some of the, the listeners might not even know what Jumper <laughs> that's, is. That's a good point. Um, Jumper is a Third Eye Blind song that was popular in the 1990s. <laughs> I, I think uh, there is also a movie, Brad. About the song? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. This is about Jumper, the uh, Doug Lyman sci-fi movie that came out in 2008 that featured um, Oscar-winning actor Hayden Christensen. 
uh, as a teleporter who gets caught up in a world where there are paladins, that's the, like this team that's trying to stop them from using their power uh, for some reason. I honestly couldn't even tell you why because I don't remember anything about that movie except the cool teleporting. Um, there's already another series that's in development called Impulse that's supposed to be a YouTube Red series. Um, but there's now a second series in development that doesn't have tie or that does have ties to the original movie, which the other series doesn't, because this one's going to feature Jamie Bell as his character Griffin, who was the more experienced jumper who apparently was the first one to actually uh, take the fight to the Paladins instead of just running from them. And he kind of mentors Hayden Christensen's character a bit. He's a little bit more of a, of a badass, kind of cocky. Uh, and he goes head on with Samuel Jackson. Um, I, I guess there's a lot more to Griffin's story than made it into the movie. There was actually a book that was released around the time that the, the movie came out called Jumper Griffin Story. And it's a prequel that follows his childhood and teenage years and how his parents were killed by paladins and all this stuff. So I'm not sure if the series is going to tell us that story or if it's going to continue with Griffin's story because since his fate was kind of left uncertain in the movie. There's a couple different approaches that could be here. Since it's Jamie Bell and it's about 10 years later now, I assume it will be set after the events of Jumper, maybe with flashbacks to his prequel story from that book, but it's it's not clear yet. Is anybody on this podcast excited for this? I honestly did not know there was a TV series after the first movie. Wasn't Dakota Fanning in the first film too? She was in it, right? I don't rem- remember Dakota Fanning in Jump. Oh no, okay. no, no, you're thinking of uh, Push. Oh my God, yeah, that was yeah a very different, <laughs> well, a very similar movie, which I think that came out at the same time. Chris Evans in, in yeah, it, right? Chris Evans, yeah, and, uh, Jaiman Hunsu, I think too. Yeah, the okay. mid the mid two thousands trend of mid budget psychic people fight each other movies, which was a thing. It was apparently. Uh, let's move on to better sci fi. Netflix has premiered the trailer for Black Mirror season four. Uh, Jacob, you have a lot to say about this. I have a surprising amount to say about this, considering that's barely a teaser. It's less than a minute long, and it really exists to reveal the titles of the six episodes of this anthology series, which are Crocodile, Archangel, Hang the DJ, USS Callister, Metalhead, and Black Museum. And each title reveal has a few shots from the episode, and since Black Mirror is a sci-fi horror anthology show full of unrelated stories, dealing with technology, and more specifically, how human foibles are further enhanced and corrupted by technology... There's a lot of desperate-looking people, a lot of scared-looking people, a lot of menacing-looking things. At one point, there's a giant robot shot in black and white lunging around. It looks really cool. Uh, the, the two things I want to talk about, the reason why I want to talk about this on the show, is that there's one episode they tease, USS Callister, which features uh, the great Jesse Plemons. You may remember from Friday Night Lights, Breaking Bad, and Fargo. And he's seen on a Star Trek-esque bridge wearing a Starfleet-esque uniform in a deep space adventure. So it means that either Black Mirror is going further into the future than it has before, where it's been sort of a near future show, or it's an episode dealing with VR or a VR experience in some way, which which would be very similar to what they've tackled before. So I'm very curious to see if Black Mirror is really going to go go space opera on us, which would be crazy, and I would be very curious to see what that looks like, or if they have, um, once again, going to do a video games are going to destroy your brain episode, which I'm also all for because... When Black Mirror gives me lectures, I tend to there's enjoy them. A, there's also a third possibility that it could take place on the set of a Star Trek like TV show like Galaxy Quest. That's right. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. But I guess there's uh, no technology hook there. So I think you're right, probably. Yep. The thing I want to talk about is that there's a story we ran a few months ago uh, where comedian slash writer slash magician Penn Gillette explained that one of his unpublished short stories called The Pain Addict was uh, b- purchased by Charlie Brooker to be used in this season. So even though a lot of the reporting going around about the season is we have no idea what's going on, we don't know what any episodes are, we actually do know. We reported on it months ago, and I recapped it here. And the basic gist is that one episode, Black Museum, which is the uh, season finale, will be structured like White Christmas, the episode from a few years ago, where it was a series of different shorts that all interconnect and eventually build the one story. And Pendulette's short story is about 
a device that allows doctors to feel their patient's pain. So doctors can diagnose what a patient has without having mm. to do invasive things on them. But the, it ends about a, a doctor who becomes addicted to the pain, becomes addicted to feeling people's pains. So he like puts it on and goes out to cause trouble and feel unique kinds of pain. And the basic gist of this finale, apparently, is a woman visits a Las Vegas museum of like tacky um, technology, and each item she approaches, she explains the history of what it is, and one of the items will be uh, the pain addict's helmet. So we at least know the, that the basic structure of one of the episodes will, will be that. So even though there's not a lot in this trailer, uh, based on the titles and based on what we do know, I think there's some good stuff to chew on there. Now... Brad Oman has never seen an episode of Black Mirror. I'm calling him out. And he re- refused to watch this trailer, but we made him watch it. Yeah, and, it's, and, I, and I acknowledge it was a ridiculous reason. I am a completist. <laughs> I do not like to watch anything out of order when it comes to watching stuff. I won't watch a later episode of a thing if I haven't seen previous episodes. We, I we, just... we, we tried to explain to Brad that not one episode is not related to the next. I get it. I get it. It's an anthology series. It's like Twilight Zone. You don't have to see previous episodes to understand the future. But I also like to see a series grow creatively and how it evolves and that kind of thing. And even though it's an anthology series, I think that there's pl- that you can still see how the series changes over the years with new seasons and that kind of thing. So Okay, I'm, so after we the, made you watch this... Yeah, what, you forced me to watch it. <laughs> what, 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 what is the reaction? We need, we, need, we need to get some payoff out of this. Well, one of the things I think it's cool that every episode title is based on the titles of tracks from that same Third Eye Blind album that we talked about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true at all. No, it's... Uh, I, 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 like I said, I know what Black Mirror is all about. Uh, you know, I think that what you see from these brief glimpses here looks really cool. Like that specifically, you know, like I see the idea of having, you know, an episode that is, that is potentially completely set on a starship similar to Star Trek. Uh, you know, it's the kind of story that you can't tell when you're working with a, a big budget movie or something like that. It's these cool one shots. It's the kind of things I would like to see from comic book movies and stuff like that. And so it looks great, but yeah, you guys are totally right. There's nothing that's revealed here whatsoever. And even, the titles don't give you an idea of what to, what to expect. Like, I mean, I could have watched this and I probably would have thought it was some kind of weird psychological experiment video, you know, that they would figure out what it does to my brain or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I had not watched the trailer when I was arguing with Brad to make him watch it. And after I watched it, I was like, <laughs> I'm he's going to think that he's vindicated after seeing this because it, like you don't know what is going on. And it seems like, oh, I'm I'm out of the loop on something this must be a callback to something else like it, it, i don't know it, it, it's such a weird advertisement but i guess you're right jacob it's it's an announcement of the the episode titles more yeah, or less i do want to um wrap up this conversation with one more note i make in the article which is that one episode is directed by john hillcoat who's best known for directing the proposition in the road two of the bleakest movies i've ever seen and he's paired with black mirror which with the exception of last season's magnificent sin junipero is the bleakest television show I've ever seen. So I think John Hillcoat directing Black Mirror is going to kill people. I people are going get to, ready like, to feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, let's move into our feature presentation on slashfilm.com. We wrote an article called "Portrait of the Joker as Young Man," where we suggested fourteen actors who should play the young Crown Prince of Crime in a uh, Warner Brothers upcoming. Uh, standalone Joker origin story movie. Uh, and we're basically going to bring that to you here on the podcast. Um, th- obviously, th- this is not based on any knowledge we have. I don't think we're, they're, they're even close to the casting phase of, of this project. Uh, what we do know is that Todd Phillips is directing, Martin Scorsese is, is producing, and that this is taking place outside of the DC EU, and that it's going to be Joker as a young criminal uh, and I'm assuming it's going to be like a gangster style movie. That's really not going to be kind of like a superhero film. Uh, now that's my assumptions. Uh, do do we know anything else? Is that um? It did, think... No, no. It, it it did say in the initial story that it was it was envisioned as a gangster crime thriller, uh, something akin to like a a taxi driver or yeah, yeah. uh king of comedy. You know, like they they equated equated Scorsese's 1980s movies to what yeah. they were searching for for this one. Yeah, and also I want to add real quick before we dive into this that this list is not kind of not the kind of thing we're like, oh, who's who's going to be cast as the Joker? This is just us thinking if we actually had to have this movie exist, because I'm not so sure it should exist, 
these are people who we personally would love to see take on this role who we actually who we would actually be excited by so it's not a realistic yeah. thing it's sort of us having fun and, and, and you might save this movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there are a lot of websites out there that will throw up lists like this. And it's the same people every time, the same directors every time. Uh, one thing I like about this list, not to pat ourselves on the back, is that the options on this list are very unique to this project. And it's either an interesting pick or a, you know, like out of the box pick. It's not these are just the guys that are on every, you know, short list for every project if that makes sense. Um, so let's start this off with you, HD. All right. So our first pick is a person of color. Uh, I talked about a little bit yesterday about how DC is starting to make a little bit more colorblind casting choices. So it'd be great if they went with Riz Ahmed for the Joker, who has shown some incredible range the past couple of years, moving on from um, his supporting role in Nightcrawler to The Night Of, and he was in another supporting role in Rogue One. But he is really incredible. He has this great quiet intensity as um, Ben Pearson wrote in his write-up for Riz. Uh, and he just like, he has he has something, I guess, a kind of gravitas to him that I think would lend to a younger Joker that is a little bit manic, a little bit all over the place. Um, I think he would be a good steady presence for the Joker. It is interesting that if you're doing this outside of the DCEU, you could do this with uh, more diversity. You could even do this with a woman Joker if, if you wanted to, uh, which we almost put on this list. Uh, Brad, give us another option. So uh, this, even though I am the resident Saturday Night Live uh, person at Slash Film and I'm obsessed with the show and I love it and will defend it to the death, I was actually not the person who suggested this next name which is Pete Davidson, uh, one of the cast members on the show. But as soon as our own Ben Pearson suggested it, I was all about it. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Pete Davidson is a current cast member on Saturday Night Live. Um, he's also a stand-up comedian. You might have seen him on the roast of Justin Bieber, if you check those out whenever they're on Comedy Central. Uh, and he's absolutely hilarious. He's also a bit of a taller, lankier guy. He's got the right build. And uh, Ben kind of pinpointed this because uh, the killing joke has – Part of the Joker's origins tied to stand-up comedy, him being a, a failed comedian of sorts. Uh, and so bringing an actual stand-up comedian into the fray to play that would be kind of an interesting idea. And Pete Davidson has this in demeanor about him where you feel like he could, you know, go crazy to any minute in a way. Um, and, and I mean that in, in, in a, a, a good way. He's just, he's got a lot of gravitas and charisma behind his performance and i just feel like if given the right opportunity he might be able to do something really really cool with this role uh so our next pick is dane dehan who has tried his uh hand at playing a villain before as the green goblin in amazing spider-man 2 he didn't get many good reviews for it but i think that he could redeem himself as a young joker I am kind of a Dahan stan. I really like his role in Kill Your Darlings, which, which is a weird role to pick out, but I really like how he portrays the sort of sen sensitive psychopath and has this sort of underlying sensuality to him. I know that's when, not what people think of when it comes to the Joker, but it would bring an interesting layer to the Joker. And he has that sort of lank lanky thinness that we see a lot in Joker depictions. He's always kind of uh, thin, not so bulky, um, kind of tired behind. And Dehan is a kind of has a face for a villain. Unfortunately, he has very baggy eyes, and he looks simultaneously very young and very old at the same time. So he could portray the Joker through a multitude of years. Um, so I I think he would be a great choice. I have this thing whenever I hear the word gaunt, I think of Dane Dehan's face. Yes. <laughs> he, he looks like he went through one of those um, extreme aging machines or something, like the torture machine in uh, Princess Bride that <laughs> takes away a year of your life. He looks like that. Him and Bran from Season 7 Game of Thrones had the same heroin dealer. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, so the next name we have, um, and this is, I guess you could say this is one of our more obvious choices, only because of one of the roles he's uh, currently best known for playing, and that's Adam Driver. Uh, you know Adam Driver because he plays Kylo Ren in Star Wars The Force Awakens, but he has quite an eclectic 
uh, filmography so far as an actor. You can see him right now in Logan Lucky playing, uh, you know, a redneck bank robber and bartender. He was also fantastic on HBO series Girls as the love interest to um, Lena Dunham's Hannah character, playing sort of a, a, a strange, troubled character. And he's also done just surprising things, too, but playing a, like a lighthearted folk singer in Inside Lewin Davis. He's fantastic in Patterson. And he's, he's just a very gifted performer. And he's not necessarily a chameleon actor, but he brings just the right amount of difference in his performances to create a defined character. Um, his role as Kylo Ren is great. He brings a lot of energy to the role. There's like there's an energy and darkness you feel that's behind him, even when he's not, you know, slicing things with his lightsaber and, and yelling at Ray and Finn. And because of his demeanor and his presence on screen, I think that he could be a really good Joker. He again, he has the same physical presence that uh, we kind of went for with this, where he's taller, um, lanky, but he uh, also very intimidating. And he, we know that he can be loud and intense, but he can also be impressively intimidating, even in his most quiet moments. And then uh, the next one, which is also still me, um, Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Garfield was uh, another amazing Spider-Man star that we thought may deserve a chance at redemption by getting a better comic book role. I think that Andrew Garfield may still have some anger and frustration left in him after The Amazing Spider-Man turned out to be such a disappointing franchise because that was a role that he loved and he was so excited to get as a lifelong Spider-Man fan. And since the studio kind of screwed him over by turning the movie into something he didn't want to make, I think that he could maybe channel that into quite an intense performance as the Joker, especially if we get to see the side of him that we see in the social network where he gets really pissed off at Mark Zuckerberg uh, as Eduardo Saverin. But uh, I also referenced a movie that you might not think to uh, talk about when you're thinking about the Joker, and that's his performance in Hacksaw Ridge. But it's only because it's clear it's you can see two different extremes that he can go to. You can be really angry and loud in the social network, but he also has this sort of uh, quiet, non-threatening demeanor that the Joker sometimes institutes. You know, there's times where the Joker doesn't seem like he's necessarily insane, but he's very playful and, and lighthearted, even in, when he's threatening people. And I think that you can see how he could bring that kind of performance to life when you see, how, like, that, you know, harmless, doe-eyed hero that he plays in Hacksaw Ridge. Uh, my first pick on this list is Joseph Gilgun, the... English actor best known for playing Cassidy, the Irish vampire on AMC's Preacher. And I hate to be the guy who says he looks like the Joker, so he must play the Joker. But Joseph Gilgun, he looks like a comic book artist through him. He's all hard angles. He's so thin. He's, he's six feet tall. He looks like he, he he looks like he's one purple suit away from like being in a comic book. And like where the Joker has this very uh, a face that was like it could like cr cr crack through paper. <laughs> um, but I, I like him a lot because there's, a, there's an unpredictability to his performances. Uh, even Cassidy on Preacher, who is this kind of laid-back, friendly guy, is violent. And he's violent with glee. And he brings to all his performances this sense of you do not know what he's going to do next. Sometimes he's going to clap you on the back and buy a beer or he'll shoot you in the face. You have no idea. And whether, whether they're on Preacher or any of his other TV shows he's been on before, he, remember he had a memorable performance in the movie This is England. He just has this unpredictable quality. I and I, I think that that's maybe the key thing about the Joker is he, his superpower is not that he's a clown; it's that you don't know what he's going to do, and you don't, and you never know what he's going to do, and that's scary. And I think Joseph Gilgun has that. And my next choice, right below this, is one that I think may get a few chuckles, and that's Jonathan Groff. And I think for a lot of people, he's always going to be that kid from Glee, or he's going to be uh, the, the voice of Kristoff from Frozen. Or you may remember him from a lot of his Broadway career, or he's he like he was recently in the main cast of Hamilton. But he's been taking some interesting choices recently. He was in HBO's uh, drama Looking, and his next project is he's the lead actor in the new David Fincher Netflix series uh, Mind Hunter, which is a David Fincher show. So you know it's obviously Jonathan Groff is not above getting a little dark because you don't work with David Fincher if you're not prepared to get your hands dirty. So we have a guy who's this singing, dancing performer who's also shown a willingness to work with David Fincher and take on dark material. So I'm just picturing a Joker who's going to kill you while he's singing about you. And for me, 
I can't imagine anything scarier than a Joker who can sing. <laughs> I, I guess I've people on this list. <laughs> I would I love the idea of of someone who can break in the song while in that makeup and while in that costume. And I think Johnny Groff is the kind of actor who may be bold and brave enough to do that. So my next choice is Freddie Highmore, who is currently playing, uh, who up until last year actually was playing Norman Bates in Bates Motel. Um, and he is a child actor who we were first introduced to in um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And he was kind of the face, well, the uh, cherub face kid that showed up in several roles of prestige dramas or indie flicks or sometimes blockbusters like August Rush or the Spiderwick Chronicles. So Base Motel was the first film in which he verged into villain territory. And I think he does so phenomenally, so much so that I think he would do a great job taking on the young version of another iconic criminal, uh, the Joker. And while Norman Bates is incredibly different from the Joker, he also has that air of unpredictab- unpredictability that we were talking about earlier, um, except he has a lot more empathy to him. There's a lot of just... Uh, sensitivity and um, uncertainty Um, and it feels at times that at least the way that Freddie Highmore is playing him that he um, is a victim of circumstance rather than fated to be a villain and I feel like that might be the direction to go for joke for the young Joker they like to um, bring a lot of empathy to these young origin stories of criminals Um, so it he might be the role for that um, in that case. Okay, so one of our most out-of-the-box picks is probably something I suggested, and that is Jonah Hill. Like um, Andrew Garfield, he also has worked with Scorsese. Uh, you know, he, he starred in uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, and he was also a lead in Todd Phillips' War Dog. So there is kind of a relationship there with the creatives. But that's not the only reason I think uh, Jonah Hill would be good for this. I mean, that's just that's just kind of putting him why he would be a part of this is uh, I don't know. He 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 has a comedy to him, but he obviously has this darkness hiding beneath the layers. And um, I, I think he has shown that he wants to transform himself for these dramatic roles. Uh, if you in June, the, the, the tabloids posted these photos of him coming out of the gym looking jacked like he he has lost like like me i want to say like a hundred pounds it looks like uh from from his last film to like this photo and this was from june who knows what he'll look like you know next year whenever they start filming this movie but uh i don't know i i just think that uh jonah hill could be an interesting out of the box pick for this uh it's just uh i don't know does anybody disagree with this one? I, I know we, we, we voted on, on this and this got through, but is anybody... Jack Jonah in, Hill is a really funny thing to say. I'll just point that out. Well, Have you seen this photo? He's like, I don't know. I don't want to say jacked, but he's very muscular and skinny. Uh, no, he's, he's definitely gotten more fit. And like he, it's so crazy to me how drastically his weight fluctuates because he put on a ton of weight for War Dogs after he was looking pretty svelte. Uh, again for like I think like the third time or something like that and uh, I mean he definitely looks like he's in shape enough to potentially pull off the role and honestly the one thing that made me like not adamantly against this was thinking about how kind of crazy he was in The Wolf of Wall Street and I just think that like that's a good key as to like what you could maybe see him do as the Joker. Yeah. I mean, there's a say, there's a sadism to his comedy too. That I think even when he's being funny, it comes from a place of cruelty almost at all times. And I think that's going to be an important aspect too. For mm-hmm. sure. And I, I could totally see him in a gangster film. He scores as he produced gangster film. Uh, Jacob, your pick comes from star Wars. Yes. Uh, I want to talk about Diego Luna, who's actually to my surprise, one of the older people on this list. So maybe he's not quite appropriate for a, an origin story for a young Joker. But he has, he has such a fresh, young face. I think he could fake it. He, I think he's almost ageless that way. And I feel like he's made a career of playing almost uh, blue-collar, working men, working-class people. Like, even in Elysium, a science fiction movie, he's playing a criminal mechanic. In Rogue One, he's a rebel soldier, but he's kind of a brow-beaten le- rebel soldier who, who holds his card, card close to his vest. But he's, he's a great actor, as you've seen in Milk and E.T. Mabatambian. And I, I feel like there's a portion, a side of him we have not seen. Having interviewed him in person for Rogue One Press, there's this energy and vibrance and a mischievousness to him in person 
that I'm not sure I've seen on screen before. And with him kind of wavering in and out of being that Scarface we may keep on threatening us with, I feel like seeing him play a criminal, uh, an insane criminal, whether it's Scarface or the Joker, that I, I feel like we need to see that. I, I feel like I want to see the Diego Luna unleashed. I want to see Luna unleashed. <laughs> It's a shame that we'll never get to see him in a Job of the Hut movie because that would make it. That would be the job of his dreams. <laughs> that would his, be his dream. He just wants to touch Java. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, my next person uh, is, is also me. It's uh, Will Poulter, very recently seen in the movie Detroit, but he also has credits. Uh, there's the versus the Revenant, where the Millers, the Maze Runner, and the Chronicles of Narnia: Voyage of the Dawn Treader. The uh, interesting bit of trivia here is that Will Poulter was originally cast as Pennywise the Clown in the movie version of It back when it was going to be a Carrie Fukunaga joint. And then uh, he left the role and it went to Bill Skarsgård. But I feel like Will Poulter, if he was interested in that role, maybe he won't play a different evil clown. And Will Poulter is such an interesting actor. He has such an interesting face that depending on how you shoot him, he looks menacing or childlike or, or anything in between. And, and I feel like an actor who can look as innocent as a cheerbook 12 year old 12 year old and then be a violent corrupt cop convincingly in detroit i feel like that's the kind of maniac range you want in a film like the joker ht was trying to get so many baby face people on this list and i i definitely see why you might want that kind of look for Did you see who they cast as young anakin skywalker he was literally a child <laughs> <laughs> but I, don't, I, I also don't think that we're gonna see like more than five minutes of joker as a child like i'm pretty sure this is gonna be like 20 something at most 30 something age joker like you know becoming who he is oh i do want to say though perfect actor to play jo- joker as a child would be jacob Trem- Tremblay. Hmm. for sure yeah i'd be all about that okay so brad <laughs> or or pierce gagnon that kid from looper yeah, he was creepy. Yeah. That would be good. There you go. So, Brad, you're up next. Who should be the Joker? Why not Harry Potter? <laughs> not the fictional character. Daniel how, Radcliffe. How did we approve this? What, what do you mean? <laughs> this is. I think You don't think Daniel Radcliffe's a good choice? Not for the role of the Joker. Why? This is a great choice, Brad. It's a great choice. I it's love very it. Very out of the box, uh, Brad. Why, why don't you explain to me why Harry Potter should be the Joker? Listen, everybody know is is go, always going to consider Daniel Radcliffe Harry Potter. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, but Daniel Radcliffe has done a very n- nice job of picking roles that are distinctly different from Harry Potter, and they've given him a very interesting career doing these lower profile dramas, uh, indies, and that kind of thing. And I feel like he's shown range that would make him good for the joker in movies like horns kill your darlings imperium all those have a mix of him showing some darker comedy or some subtle drama work or some intensity uh and i think that he can channel all of that into playing the joker extremely well you know i mean harry potter is nothing like the joker and that's that's i mean but he's an actor like that's kind of the idea is he can get into these different roles and on the more comedic side is we've seen him be kind of, uh, you know, comedic in a way in Swiss Army Man, of, in a very weird, weird way in that movie. And I just, I just think that there's so much more to Daniel Radcliffe than being Harry Potter, and he, he's, he's proven that, but he needs a much bigger role and a larger spotlight to really show what he can do, and I think that the Joker could be it. I, I think I'm just so, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at this photo that you have in the article, and now you see me too, he was such a bad villain. In that movie, but that villain that that movie wasn't good, so yeah, maybe exactly. I shouldn't. Yeah, I feel like he, he he's he's out of um, proper language, but he he's out of fucks to give. Daniel Radcliffe doesn't need money; he just wants to be adventurous. And I feel like um, this is the kind of role you can you, where you can do whatever you want and get money while he gets while he um while he can. Yeah. All right, so my next choice is Lakeith Stanfield who I decided to stand, as they say, in the fan community uh, after I saw him at the Comic-Con panel for Death Note, which is not a movie I'm excited to see, but I'm very excited that he's in it. Because at the Comic-Con panel, he was wearing such a distinct and out-there wardrobe that I feel like as a 
from his personality, he would be best suited for the Joker. So <laughs> this, it's strange to base my um, decision on his fashion choices, but he was wearing like this, what I can only be described as a corset at one point. At another point, he wore this all black shiny suit with a net on his face. Um, and he's kind of built his role off of playing these idiosyncratic characters, or at least his most famous role is uh, as Darius in Atlanta, who was this sort of erudite, eccentric character who would spout off lines like, uh, you assume perversion of the word daddy, I think it stems from a fear of mortality, which very much sounds in line like Russ Cole in True Detective. But he's extremely talented. He started to stretch his um, acting chops a little bit more in films like Get Out, um, in which he appeared in the first scene, and um, and later on in the film, as well as the upcoming film Crown Heights. Uh, and he has shown up in various other films. I saw him in The Incredible Jessica Jones, in which he was a supporting character and acted fairly normal, which is very strange to see. But I'm excited for him. I have not yet seen Death Note, so I, but I heard, I've heard great it, things about his performance. I was going to say, it's, it sounds like you're better off not seeing Death Note, but um, I I don't think you're wrong in looking at the fashion choices of, of act. I mean, actors go to auditions in L.A. and they dress for the role, hoping mm-hmm. that that will help them. So, I mean, it, that is something that definitely goes into the decision in the casting office. So why not in this list? Uh, it was. The- Honestly, well, though, to support that too, it wasn't even just his wardrobe at Comic Con that I thought was also interesting. But he was acting kind of weird during yeah, the camp. his behavior. Like, like, yeah, like he was almost being in. I don't know if he was trying to be in character as his Death Note character on the panel, but he he was he seemed almost kind of villainous. Like he was very obviously and deliberately chomping on some candy and almost looked kind of menacing while he was doing it. <laughs> yeah, he was glaring throughout the panel. And then recently there were some red carpet pictures of him at the premiere for Death Note in which he wore this long sleeved, what looked like almost a prison jumpsuit and was posing very strangely with his arms up in the air. And I was like, you know what? I can see this this guy's a joker. And if he's not the joker, I will just follow him for life. <laughs> well, 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 our last and final choice is Miles Teller. Um, Miles Teller broke onto the scene with the spectacular now and Whiplash. I mean, he had films before that, obviously, but those are the films I think that got him notoriety. Um, but his career choices since then have not been the best. He has flocked to franchise projects like Fantastic Four and the Divergent series instead of more character-driven, prestigious films that he probably should have stuck to. Uh, The great thing about the Joker origin story is it could fit comfortably in the middle of both categories. And like Jonah Hill, uh, he has a relationship with Todd Phillips starring in his last film, War Dogs. Uh, on the other side, it has been reported in the gossip rags that Teller uh, has ascertained a uh, abrasive reputation on set. Uh, so it's unclear if someone like Phillips, who has worked with him previously, would be interested in working with him again. Uh, but I could easily imagine Teller uh, being great as the young gangster in a period like Gotham film. I mean, he has a darkness to him. He has a comedy to him. And uh, I think he could be really great and menacing if he wanted to be. He's very cocky, too, which I think would be a good choice for a young Joker. He looks like a school bully. I, I, I think that's an interesting thing. For sure. So who did we miss? Who who should be the Joker? Send me an email at uh, peter at slash film dot com or, sent, or, or tweet it at us at slash film daily. That's at slash film daily. Uh, as always. You can find this article in much more on SlashFilm.com. You can subscribe to SlashFilm Daily on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, all the popular podcast apps. Uh, you can find Jacob Hall at Jacob S. Hall on Twitter. You can find HT at H. Tran Bowie on Twitter. Brad Omen is the complicated one, and you can find him at Ethan underscore Anderton on Twitter and go flix yourself on iTunes. Um Please, speaking of iTunes, go to iTunes, give us a review, rate us, especially if you like it. If you don't, send us an email and tell us why not and what we can do to be be doing better. Uh, And um, yeah, spread the word. We'll see you next time.